Masechet Yoma, Daf 72. And we have a lot of different topics today. Here's an outline. Uh, we're going to talk, talk, talking about the robe, parochet, and choshen. Yesterday we mentioned that the threads of the, each of the pieces of clothing that the Kohanim wear are made out of uh, multiple strands. And most of them are made out of six strands, but the, the robe is 12, the parochet is 24, and the choshen is 28. So we're going to derive each of these numbers, and we're going to start with that. Uh, then we're going to talking about, talk about ripping the clothing of the of a, a big dekiwana, which is prohibited. Uh, related to that is removing the poles. Uh, we're going to see these two are related. I made them both blue because they have a similar derivation. And then we're going to go into some of the kelim of the Bet HaMikdash, uh, going from clothing to kelim. Uh, we'll see what the connection is. Uh, we'll start with the wood of the Mishkan walls, then going back to the clothing and their significance, then talking about the Aron, and then from the Aron, we transition to Torah. So you see that um, like G is a little bit out of order, um, and I'm going to try to explain the order, but it's not very apparent why it goes back and forth. But let's start at the beginning. Meril Shenem Asad Minelan. How do we know that the Meril is, uh, has, is, is 12? So I'll show you a picture here. We have, uh, this is one picture. Here's another one that's made by the Temple Institute. Uh, so the male is the blue overall that goes on top of the, um, uh, of the, of the tunic. Uh, so you see it's all made out of blue and on the bottom are the pomegranates, the, uh, the cloth made, made out of cloth, the pomegranate uh, ornaments. And on top of it is the ephod and the choshen. Um, okay, the ephod, by the way, I'll just show you a picture here. Uh, you see in this picture, they make the ephod kind of like a, a, a big waistband. Um, uh, that's how they interpret it. Usually it's interpreted like this, like an a, a apron. Um, but either way, the ephod is, goes uh, on top and then the choshen is connected to it. Uh, okay, so now that we have the pictures in mind, how do we know that this meril is, uh, has, is 12 times uh, uh, threaded? So really the Kelil Peshat sounds, sounds like it means all blue, like in that picture, it's all made out of blue. Um, but the Gemara is going to take the word Kelil as uh, being spun. And just as the Parochet was made out of six, we said most of them standard is six, and this is Kelil Techelet, so it's uh, six plus six, so that's how you get 12 for, uh, for this. Uh, now question, why are you, why are you comparing the, um, the Meril to the, uh, to the, um, uh, to the, uh, the Parochet? Uh, why not, sorry, the Parochet was 24. We're actually going to see that in a second. But it's made out of four different colors. So it's six times four. Uh, this one just says, Kelia Techelet, so six times two. So the question is, why are you comparing this uh, to the parochet? Why not learn it from the actual uh, the hem and the pomegranates that are on the, at the bottom of the uh, of, of of it? Malalan Shimona, Afkan Shimona, and as we said before, the pomegranates are made out of three different materials, and so six times three, right? We um, and so each one is eight. Sorry, eight times three. Each one is eight. So Danin Kelim Ikliv and Danin Kelim Etachshit Keli. We're going to derive a utensil from a utensil. Utensil here means something that you use, including clothing. So we're going to derive uh, one type of clothing, one type of uh, uh, utensil, a curtain um, uh, or the, uh, uh, the meal itself from, from each other and not from the bells, which are just an ornament. And that's something that's, that's uh, more different. Then we ask, Adrabah, Danin Gufo Mi Gufo. Why not learn the 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 um, the meal from itself? Because uh, the bottom of it, right, is uh, is uh, the bottom of it is the pomegranates, and so learn it that that's twenty four, just like this is going to be. Um, uh, this is twenty four. So and then in right and then in go for alma. It's fine. Just like there, it's um, eight, and so here it would be eight. Over there it's eight times three, so this would be maybe eight times two, so maybe they make it 16. No, we're going to learn one kili uh, from another and not from an ornament. Adraba, sorry, I'm going back now. Learn, learn from the, uh, this, this rope itself. 
and not from something else, right? Don't go to the curtain, go to this thing itself. No, you're right. Uh, I'm not going to compare this to anything else. Rather, the reason why I'm learning six here is because in the Braita we saw yesterday said, if it doesn't say anything, assume it's six. But since here it doesn't say anything, assume it's six. But it says uh, Khalil, and that makes it times two. And that's how we get 12. Okay, we finished with that. Next is the Parochet, the curtain, Asim Ba'arba'a, 24. Arba'a de Shita Shita. La dina ve la dayana. So this is a simple one um, because the parochet is the pasuk. I see the parochet techelet, argaman, tolat shani, and shesh. That's four different um, types of material. Each one of them is going to be six. Six times four, you get 24. So there's no judgment, no judge. There's nothing to discuss. This is an easy one. Okay, next, the choshen and ephod. Esrim u shmona. These are 28. In the land. So let's look how many items are mentioned. Zahav, Techelet, Argaman, Tolat Shani, and Shesh. Actually, five different types of thread that are mentioned. Now, Arba'a de Shita Shita. Now, the last four of these, keep the Zahav separate. Techelet, Argaman, Tolat Shani, and Shesh um, are is each going to be six. That makes 24. Sin of Arba'a. Zahav, Arba'a. And the Zahav, only six uh, threads of that. Ha, yeah, 24 plus four, you get 28. Now question, you're all asking, make the gold also uh, six, and then you'll have, uh, uh, get it up to 30, right? Why is, this, why is the gold only four? We're gonna see two answers to this. This is Etilim, this is how you're going to make these golden threads, hammer out a sheet, and then you cut it, um, and you and you combine it into the techelet and the argaman and tolachani and the shesh maase hoshev. Okay, so since it says he says petilim, how many is that? Petil is a wick. So already, if you have a wick, you're intertwining something. So petil by itself means two. Petilim is a plural of that. Two times two is four, and that's how you get four. Uh, but there's no uh, uh, no reason to make it six. We here we have it says it's four. But now Rav Asher Amar Amar Pera La Asot Betocha Techelet U Betocha Argaman. He has a different way of deriving it. The word La Asot is always key. We saw yesterday when it says La Asot, it means all equal. So Hechin Abed Abed Arbaa De Tere Tere. If you're going to put four uh, threads, which you're going to put two with each of the other types of threads. Now two and two and two with each of the colors. Then you're gonna get eight because there's four co colors besides the, um, the besides this one. And that'll be, so that'll be too many. Um, if you're gonna put, and two of them, you'll put two and two and the other ones you put one and one. Now we can't do that. You have to all be equal. So there's no way to make it six, actually. Uh, and therefore, um, it has to be the has to be equal. So how could it be equal? One, one each, then you'll get four. That's how he derives that it's four. So that's the that takes care of the choshen and ephod that are five different types of material, um, six times four, and plus another four for the gold. Next, Amar Rachava, Amar Rachava, Amar Rav Yehuda. Someone purposely uh, 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 rips any big de kiuna, they get malkut. How do you know? This is actually talking about the me'il of the ephod. It's called the me'il ephod because the, um, the ephod goes on it. Um, so, so in other words, the opening, right? This is the, you're putting it over, he's putting it over his head. The opening should have some kind of hem so that it won't rip, which makes sense. Uh, most clothing does has, have that. So in the Peshat of the Pasuk, it sounds like the mitzvah is how you make it. You make it with a hem so that it won't rip. But the Gemara derives, no, also, you're not allowed to rip it uh, for any reason. So Ravacha asks about the 
really what I just said is the pesha. Maybe the mitzvah is to make a hem so that it won't rip. There's no separate mitzvah not to rip it. And we say, no, that can't be that what it means because miketiv she lo yikareya. Does it say so that it won't rip? Um, it doesn't, does, that's not the reason. It just says lo yikareya. And so since it says it as a, a, a declarative statement, um, therefore it's a separate prohibition not to rip the clothing. Good. Um, so oh, so far we're all, all dealing with clothing, but now we're gonna transition into something about the, the, furni the furnishings. Um, but you'll see why. Amar bi al azad. Hamaziyah khoshen me'al ha'efod ve'hamesir badeh aron lokeh. If someone would take the khoshen, the breastplate, off of their ephod, it's, it's attached. Um, it's always attached. It has to stay attached. If you remove it, or if you remove the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the poles from the aron, they have to stay there all the time. Someone removes them, lokeh. Here's the transition from clothing to furniture. And each, each of them, one, one of them says it should not be detached or should not be removed. Good, so that's a halacha. And now we have a question. Same, he's the same sage I just asked about the Peshat before. Um, right, Yaakov. He says, no, maybe, maybe the mitzvah is attach it strongly so that it won't be, be it won't get loose and be removed. In other words, the pole should not be loose and movable, right? Uh, attach them in a permanent way. Maybe that's the mitzvah. It's about how to make it, not that once after it's made that you can't move it. Um, you're going to make it there permanently. So uh, that's this question. And so we answer, it doesn't say a sheen uh, that you should make it so that it won't move, right? But rather it says make it and don't move it. So since it doesn't have a sheen, it's a separate prohibition. Okay, so this um, idea of, uh, of being there permanently, we're gonna see this as a theme. So we continue to be Yosef, to be Chanina Rameh. That's the pasuk that we just quoted, that the uh, rods have to be in the Aron and they cannot leave. But another pasuk says that the poles should be put into the rings. That sounds like you put them into the rings, but they are movable. You can put them in, you, I guess when you're gonna move them, right? When you're gonna carry it, and then they, you can take them out if you need to. So which one is it? This is a contradiction. Yes, they can be removed, but they can't be totally taken out. In other words, they're movable, they're loose, um, but they're, they're the, on the edges, they're thick, so that uh, you wouldn't be able to get them out I mean, you know, without, uh, without great difficulty. Um, so that's the, that's the compromise between them. But the idea is that they do stay in forever. Uh, this is interesting halacha. Why? We understand when there was Mishkan, you have to leave them in because you never know when it's time to when it's time to travel. You have to always have them have them there to be ready. Because if they're not ready, and then you're going to improvise, you're going to try to carry it with your hands. You're going to not, not carry it properly. You can drop it. So leave them in all the time. But once you have a better Mikdash, why uh, why do you need to leave them in all the time? Maybe this is a reminder that uh, really the Mishkan is the ideal, right? It's supposed to be something that travels all over. This is a, a holy place for all of the nation. And uh, it's not only any one, one place that's holy, but wherever the Shekhinah is, right? That's, uh, that, that, place, it, 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 that place is holy. So maybe leaving the rods in is a kind of reminder of the Mishkan, the movable status of the Mishkan. Uh, okay, that's just, that's just a suggestion. And we have another B'dayta that is going to support this. On the one hand, they have to be there. Does that mean that they're not movable at all? You put them there, that means they are movable. If you only had the second pasuk, you'd say, I guess they can be taken out and put back. It says they have to be there. It means they can be removed, but not totally. They can be moved around, but they can't totally be totally be removed. Because you can adjust them, uh, but you should never take them out. Uh, now, uh, now this is regarding the entire Mishkan. the The walls are made out of these um, 
uh, uh, pillars. And so they're made out of team that are standing up. What do you mean standing up? I mean, you know from the, just from the dimensions that they're not lying down. You don't take these long, these long things and put them on top of each other like, uh, each other like bricks, right? It's clear that they're standing up and we attach the sockets and the bottoms, right? So what does it mean rather? Uh, it uh, should be stood up the way that it grows, right? So here's an example of an acacia tree. So um, these trees are particularly good at getting a long, uh, flat piece of wood. And when you put them in the Mishkan, the bottom, the trunk should be on the bottom and the top of the tree should be on top when you put, put it in the Mishkan, the way that it grows. This is the halakha that applies in other cases also, like uh, lulav, etrog. Right, so right, we uh, you have to hold it right side up the way that it grows. That's the um, that's that's uh, that's how it's held um, in a kasher way. Or another interpretation, omedim shema amidim et sipuyan that the, the, they're they're covered they're covered with gold. So it has to be uh, strong enough, made in a certain way, so that it can handle and uh, hold the the gold plating that will be on top of it. A third interpretation, omedim. Maybe you'll say, oh, there's no, no more Mishkan. And so that's it. We uh, abandon hope and these, we're never going to have, have it again. No, that uh, they will stand forever uh, and they'll, 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 they'll return. They're going to be there some, they're going to come back. Uh, so I think this is a second reference to uh, this uh, being there forever. So on my chart here, it's right. So we, you understand the transition from clothing to removing poles, because that was the same type of derivation. Lo yikareya, right? Lo yasuru, not as a reason, but as a commandment. And once we mention that the poles are there forever, so you see the wood of the Mishkan walls, that symbol remains forever and ever. Even if you don't have the physical uh, walls, you will, we always remember them. And so um, I think that's the connection between those two. Now we go back to clothing. Um, oh, it's also the same sage. Okay, so this would explain uh, why, why they're back to back. The same sage is teaching these. The clothing um, of the Bigdeh Kiyona is called Bigdeh uh, Serad, which literally means like uh, something that will be for a leftover. Like, what is it? What is he talking about? And answer is the enemies of Israel's euphemism for Israel. If not for the big day Kohen, um, there would not be left in, uh, for, from the Jewish nation even a, a remnant, even a survivor. In other words, the zechut of big day Kiona is what uh, helped us to survive uh, various challenges. And so here, another reference to something that's lasting forever. So there's a connection between the sage that said it, but I think there's also a thematic uh, uh, connection. Good. Rabbi Shimuel ben Nachmani Amar, Debei Rabbi Shimon Tana, Begadim shegordin otan kebiriyatan mikelehen, umesaredin mehen kelum. Another interpretation, what does it mean, bigde serad? Uh, that it should be a garment that's woven completely. Um, not like uh, some garments, uh, you know better than me, had a, Make garments, maybe right. You, uh, it's not that you take one sheet and then cut it up, and then out of each piece you sew all the you sew the garment together. But rather that you should prepare the whole garment on a loom, all as one. And the leftover is just going to be uh, just barely, just a little bit uh, that you're going to have to sew. So the least amount of sewing it should be as much as possible woven on a loom. Maihi, what does it mean the that leftover piece? This is a needlework that you need just to finish off, finish off the garment, uh, the last seams. Um, but, uh, but, but most of it has to be on the loom. And that's what it means, big day, serad, that there's hardly anything left or a little bit left. Metibe, hold on, is that true? We have another braita. Big day, kyuna, enosinotan, maase, machat, ele maase, oreg. Tenemar, maase, oreg. So we have another bright that says, has to be all woven on a loom and not sewn at all. Amad answer, lo ela de bet yad shelahem. We're only talking about the sleeve. It's impossible. You can't make a whole thing on a, on a, on a, on a loom, including the sleeves. Uh, so rather you make the whole thing flat, nice, and then you can, you're allowed to sew the sleeves on. That's what um, the, the, um, 
uh, the Bishim I was talking about before. Um, as it says in another Braita, that the sleeve was woven separately, and then it was connected, it was sewn onto the rest of, uh, of it, and it would reach all the way to the palm of the hand. He said, yeah. um, okay, um, there's another interpretation. Remember Yosef's uh, uh, coat was called... Um, um uh pass right um was it ketonet pasim so some people say it means that it had many colors but it doesn't really mean that and so i think ibn ezra says pasim that it had very long sleeves very long uh, uh hems uh which means you know who wears things like that only royalty or magicians um, um they, they most usually people who are not working because you can't work out in the field if you have long sleeves that hang all the way down and so that's the point. Joseph was wearing something that had long sleeves, and that shows I'm not here to work. And that's why, partly, why the brothers got angry. Oh, you're, uh, you know, you, 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 you live like royalty. We have to do all the work, and you, and you just, uh, you know, and uh, you do nothing. Okay. Now, Okay. Now we're going back to the Aaron. And uh, the Adon was constructed with wood in the middle and had gold plated with gold on the outside and gold on the inside. Interesting because no one ever saw the inside. Um, and nevertheless, it's gold on the inside. So how do you make that? You have to actually make three boxes, um, each one that fits inside the other. Um, the middle one is going to be made out of wood and it's going to be nine tefachim. Why? Uh, we know it's an amma bachetzi uh, high. Amma is six tefachim, so Amma Vachetzi is nine tefachim. So the middle one, from bottom to top, is nine tefachim. Penimi shel zahav shemona. The inner box made out of gold is going to be only eight high because the base of the wood, made out of wood, itself takes up one tefach. Uh, so the from the the in the interior is only eight tefachim high. Hitzon asara umashehu. The outside gold box has to be ten plus a little bit because it has to extend. Uh, further down, this you know b- beyond the the, the base, um, has to also go up a little at uh, the top. Now, question: Is that true? We have another brayta says that the outer uh, the outer one made out of gold is not ten and a little, but eleven tefachim uh, and a little bit. So how could that be? This brayta about eleven. That goes according to the opinion that says. That uh, there was the, the the base made out of gold itself was a tefach. So you have a base of wood tefach, then another base of gold tefach. That's a lot of gold um, there, and so therefore it has to be eleven because you need that tefach plus the ten plus the uh, plus the other ten that are um, that are that are there beside it. Um, so ha eman de amar and be of your tefach. Whereas the one that said it's just a little bit. That goes by the opinion that it's just it's very thin, and so it could just be um, just be a tiny bit. Um, good. Oh, my mashehu zed. Now, this mashehu that you have to add a little bit. Why do you have to add a little bit? Well, on top there's a crown, there's an ornament that goes all around the edge of the ark, and so that sits a little bit higher. Um, after all, the the parochet is also going to fit on fit on top, right? It right in there. So this uh, this extra bit is for the the crown. Now we, now we're going to talk about the crowns. There are three vessels that have crowns. Shel mizbeach, veshel aron, veshel shulchan. The altar, the mizbeach hazahav, has a crown around it. Also the aron and also the shulchan. Now shel mizbeach, zacharon and talo, and each one is given to a different person. The crown of the mizbeach. That's Aaron. He makes the sacrifices on the Mizbeach, Mizbeach HaKetoret. And so he takes that crown. So Shulchan, Zachar David Un Talo. Shulchan represents um, uh, 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 bounty, goodness, prosperity, material things. And so that's David as royalty. He takes that. Shel Aaron, but the crown around the Aaron, what's in the Aaron is Torah. Anyone can come and um, and and derive the benefit from the crown of the Torah. 
Shema Tomar Pachutu, Tomar B, Melachim Yimlocha. Maybe you'll think, oh, this is a lower one. I'd rather be a Kohen. I'd rather be a king. No. The Pasuk in Mishle, which is talking about Chokma, and we're understanding Chokma is the same as the wisdom of the Torah, um, it says, kings reign through me. In order to be a king, you have to know they have to have wisdom, you have to have the Torah. But actually, the Torah is above all of them. Okay, this is similar to the other famous uh, Midrash that says there are three crowns. Right? I don't think one, David's one. The other one is a meritocracy. It's available for every, everyone, anyone who wants to learn Torah and become sage. Okay, this links back to the theme we saw yesterday of the caring relative values of Kohanim and Chachamim. And here saying that Chachamim have an advantage. Rabbi Yochanan Rameh. Now, still while we're talking about the crowns, Ketib Zer, the Karenan Zar. Another Ketib, it says, sorry, Ketib Zar, it's written Chaser. So it's Zar, meaning a foreigner. But we read it uh, Zer, uh, meaning a crown. So, how, why? Zacha, Nasa, Naset Lo Zer, Lo Zacha, Zara Hemenu. If you merit uh, to, to learn Torah in a proper way, then there'll be a crown for you. But if you do not merit, and you don't learn Torah, don't learn it in a proper way, then it's going to be a stranger to you. You'll it'll be uh, you'll forget your studies. Will not be will not be part of your life at all. It'll be a stranger. Now the Biochanan Rame Keti Vasita Lecha Adon Ais Uchti Vasu Adon Ase Shitim. The Biochanan is giving another contradiction that also is related to the Adon. Uh, on the one hand, the first, uh, in Devarim it says. Hashem tells Moshe, you make an Aron. Sounds like Moshe is supposed to go get the hammer and build it himself. But then it says, Asu, they made, they made the Aron, Aser Shitim. So which one is it? Does Moshe make it or does everybody make it together? So we learn from here that the people in a, in a city should, are commanded to help out a Tamid uh, Chacham to perform this, to help him with his work so that he can have more time to study Torah, right? If he's uh, selling uh, merchandise, you know, help him make a few sales so that he can do it quickly and then he can go and learn. Uh, so now the Aron is, um, is, uh, is uh, 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 covered from inside and outside. It's beautiful derasha. And we learn from the architecture of the furniture that just like it's plated inside and outside, so to a tamid chacham, his inside should be like his outside. Um, it's true, there's wood in the middle, but that doesn't matter. The point is, no, even though nobody sees the inside of the Aron, you still put gold there. So, um, uh, so to a chacham should be golden both on the outside and on the inside. And that'll be the theme for the rest of these derashot. Not only is the person who is a hypocrite, not called the mitchacham, he's even called disgusting. Right, what, someone uh, uh, of loathsome and foul, a man who drinks iniquity like water. In other words, even though he's drinking Torah like water, yes, he's a tamit chacham, he learns a lot, but if his inside is not the same, if he's doing it in an insincere way, and uh, he's uh, doing bad things at the same time, then even the Torah that he drinks is considered disgusting. The pasuk from Mishle, he says, what is the meaning of this pasuk? It says, um, there's money in the hands of a fool to buy wisdom, but he has no mind to acquire the wisdom. Like, why would you take money if you're not going to buy anything? Uh, if you have no possibility of buying anything. So what does this mean? Woe to the enemies of the sages. It means the sages who are, who are unworthy. Those who study Torah, but they do not have fear of heaven. Right? So they have... You know, they have a lot of uh, a lot of currency, which is the Torah that they learn, but nothing to buy it with, because the purpose of learning Torah is to lead one to Yirat Shamaim. And if a person does not have Yirat Shamaim, then it's all its currency is worthless. Right, 
This is a nice metaphor, right? Uh, a pity on him who has no courtyard, but he has a gate to the courtyard. What's the point of a gate of, of the courtyard if you have no courtyard? So the same thing, the fear of heaven is like the courtyard. The Torah is the gate. The Torah is what protects it. So great, you have a very tall gate, but no courtyard, nothing to protect. What's the point of someone's Torah if they have no Yirat Shamayim? Okay, they're getting uh, more and more sharp in their statements. He would tell, uh, Rabbi would tell the other sages, the students, he said, please don't get Gehinam twice. What do you mean Gehinam twice? If you have no Yirat Shamayim, you're not, you're not going to Olam Haba. And you're going to spend all your day studying, toiling in Torah, and not having any materialism, any, be any, any benefit in this world. So you're going to experience Gehinam in this world, and you're not getting anything because you're not going to get anything in the next world. Okay, he's not telling them to leave Torah. He's telling them, right, be sincere in your study of Torah. Use it to acquire your Shamaim. And that way, um, your, your devotion uh, now will pay off later as well. This is a Torah that Moshe placed before them, Sam. Um, but Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi makes a midrash on it. We read the scene like it's a samech, uh, which means a, a, a medication. If you, mer uh, uh, if you merit and you learn Torah properly and it goes, it gets, gets inside you and gives you Yirat Shamayim, then it will be a medication that will give you life. Lo zacha, naset lo samita. But if someone does uses the Torah in an improper way, then it becomes a, 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 posh, a, a poison for him. I mean, you know, when we see uh, uh, when we see observant people doing uh, doing bad things, um, this is what it's talking about, right? The, the, the rabbis from back then knew that um, people can can look one way and uh, look like they're Tamidah Hamim, but not act that way. Um, so, and it could be it can be used for dangerous purposes. So, therefore, we have to make sure uh, to use it for good. Rava said a similar thing. Someone who's skilled and knows how to study, um, he does it. It becomes a life for him. Otherwise, the opposite. Similar to medications. If you know what to do with medication, you're a good doctor, then they'll give you life. If you take all the wrong medications for the wrong disease, then it's uh, then that will kill a person. Okay, the rest of the daf is going to be all dirashot on Mizmor 19, where it's all about Torah. So, on the one hand, the, uh, the, 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 the mitzvot of God are straight and make a person happy. But then it says, Sirufa means to refine. When you uh, get, take, take, get metal, uh, from uh, you know iron ore, so you have to refine it by by uh, by heating it up to a very very hot temperature. So it's, this is difficult. This is um, corresponding to challenges, even punishment. So which one is it? Does it make you happy, or does it purify a person by, in a, by smelting them, which is a painful process? Sorry, uh, the answer is If a person merits, then it will make a person happy. If not, then it's just going to be torture. This, like he said, if a person merits, it will purify. So according to the Shakish, actually the purification itself, smelting itself can be understood in both ways. In other words, it's difficult no matter what. But uh, through that difficult process of toiling and studying Torah, if you're lucky, it will bring you to life. If not, it will be the opposite. It was interesting to them to compare these two answers, right? You know, when uh, a person's wasn't mean person's lucky. I guess you have a good, uh, you know, good yeshiva, a good, uh, good teacher, a good curriculum. Then you know, he's, he's learned easily. Is that, is that the hope? Or the Shaki says, listen, it's difficult either way. Yeah, but you hope that um, that difficulty will lead to will lead to fruition. Um, and uh, and success. Okay, Yirat Adonai Tehora, Omedet La'ad, fear of God is pure, stands forever. Amar Bichanina, Zeh Lomed Torah, Betahora, Maihi, Nose Isha, Be'achar Kach, Lomed Torah. How do you learn Torah in purity? Uh, first get married and then learn Torah. And that way your thoughts will be only on Torah. 
עדות אדוני נאמנה, אמר רבי חייא בר אבא, נאמנה היא להעיד בלומדיה. What does it mean that testimony of God is faithful? Why is Torah called testimony? Because yes, the Torah is, uh, is faithful to testify, uh, this person studied me, this person did not study the Torah. Uh, so um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a witness as well, as well. Okay, good. Now we get back to the clothing of the, uh, of the Kohen Gadol. Ma'aseh uh, 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 okay, there's two different places. One of them, there's uh, in the Mishkan, in front, at the entrance of the Mishkan, when you go from outdoors to indoors, there's a masach, the screen. And that screen, it says, is ma'ase rokem, as an act of embroidery. On the other hand, the parochet is called ma'ase choshev, an act of a, a work of a designer. So what does this mean? So Rabbi El Azar assumes that they're the same thing, even though one's a screen and one's a curtain. The idea is that first you have a designer that will draw what you, where the design should go, and then you have an embroiderer that will uh, sew on the, that, that ornament that will be there. Um, okay, maybe it was a lion or an eagle or keruv. Okay, Tana Mishemed Rabbi Nehemiah. Another different answer is no, they didn't actually look the same. When it says okay, that's for the screen, that is, uh, that's uh, something that's sewed in. And therefore, it's only on one side would you see it. When you sew it, it looks the same. However, the embroidered one, the designed one, that one is is uh, oreg, um, is is woven or embroidered, and that can be different on each side. It's, it's just two ply, so you can have one form on one side and another picture on the other side. So um, according to this, the maaser or kem, the screen would be simpler, and the and the parochet would be double sided. Um, good. And uh, okay, and that's it. So then uh, tomorrow we'll, we'll uh, talk about the Urim V'Tumim, which was the last thing mentioned in the Mishnah. Amen, amen.